All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for registering to attend this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to you about advanced sedimentation technologies for improving water quality. Uh, but before we jump into the presentation, I would like to just uh, give you a little bit of uh, house rules on how things are going to go. Uh, first of all, this presentation is, is being recorded and uh, we will be able to share with you the recording after the event. And we'll also be sharing with you copies of the PowerPoint slides in PDF format. Uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions for this presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. And uh, for those of you who have questions that maybe you want to ask by email, uh, feel free to send a return email to the email I just sent you uh, with the Zoom link. Okay, without any further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Kirsten McFarlane and Brad Grinko. Uh, but to kick things off for us, Kirsten is going to go first. So Kirsten, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Charles. And thanks to Simi for hosting this webinar. Uh, so as you mentioned, um, uh, I'm, my name is Kirsten. I'm with Greenland Consulting. Um, and I'm joined by Brad Grigo, who's with the ClearFlow Group. Uh, and here, today we're here to discuss uh, their advanced sedimentation technologies for improving water quality. And I'm going to start off uh, by discussing uh, an erosion control and advanced sedimentation pilot project that was conducted in the town of Innisfil uh, before passing off to Brad to go into more detail on uh, ClearFlow's products and their application in the mining industry. So just a bit of an introduction on Greenland and our uh, collaboration with ClearFlow. Uh, so Greenland is a Canadian civil and environmental engineering enterprise. Uh, and since 2015, Greenland and ClearFlow have worked collaboratively on innovative water management solutions using ClearFlow's product line with Greenland's 30 year uh, engineering track record in stormwater management. So this includes not only site level mining industry solutions to address uh, regulatory compliance targets, but having regard for cumulative river basin conditions from a broader environmental risk mitigation perspective. So one of Greenland's web-based analytical tools being used uh, is called Threats and was profiled uh, actually at a previous CME webinar in July of 2021. Uh, so Greenland's expertise in the clean tech industry with other water treatment technology vendors enables us to design hybrid treatment systems that can take full advantage of ClearFlow's advanced sediment removal product systems. So just a bit of uh, background on our project in Innisfil. So the purpose of that study was to assess advanced sedimentation technologies or ASTs, which are designed to reduce sediment and nutrient loading rates to Lake Simcoe from stormwater runoff generated by development sites. So with that in mind, we had three primary goals to demonstrate the effectiveness of ASTs using clear flow products applied towards unstabilized sites to reduce erosion and discharge of sediment and associated nutrients from new development to downstream water bodies, and by achieving those first two goals to directly contribute in a net reduction in future municipal liability when complying with Lake Simcoe Protection Plan requirements. Um, so then just some background on stormwater management in Ontario. So per Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Park Guidelines, stormwater management facilities or swim facilities are effective at removing sediment that's greater than 40 micrometers in diameter. However, in areas with fine grain soils, TSS will move right through these swim facilities without removal and be able to impact downstream water courses. Uh, so this TSS is also an efficient vector for nutrients and heavy metals, of particular concern for our Innisfil project being phosphorus, uh, which also produce neg negative effects downstream. So being able to identify methods uh, to remove these fine sediments less than 40 micrometers in diameter is then critical to improve the health of uh, downstream water bodies and achieve sustainability goals. Uh, so our subject site uh, included the Sleeping Line subdivision, uh, which has three active stormwater management facilities. Uh, the first of which being Swim Facility 4 in the north, which represents a pre-servicing construction condition. Uh, so the stormwater infrastructure is in place, but all the lots have been topsoil stripped and are pre-construction. And then we have swim, our temporary swim facility seven in the south, which represents an unstabilized site undergoing area grading. Um, so there's no permanent stormwater infrastructure in place and the topsoil has been stripped. And then finally, we have swim facility six to the east, 
um, which is a partially stabilized site. So it's mostly been developed upstream with some areas still under construction. And all three of those swim facilities discharge to Lake Simcoe in the east. Uh, so we were studying two of ClearFlow's ASTs uh, for this project, the first of which being their gel flocculent blocks. Uh, so this product increases sedimentation rates during regular swim facility operation. So it's a passive process um, where their blocks react with very fine particles held in stormwater runoff and cause the sediment to bind together. So what this does is it allows all the finer sediment to settle out uh, more quickly in the four bays of the receiving swim facilities rather than passing right through. So I just have a quick video during the maintenance uh, of these blocks. Um, so they're all just strung up on a rope and attached with a carabiner. So it's very simple during removal to remove the blocks that are spent um, and put to reattach the fresh blocks. So a very simple process, just attached onto a carabiner uh, along the rope. And then once they're all attached, they can then be lowered back into uh, the storm sewer or back along uh, a ditch or swale as needed. All right, and so the second clear flow AST that we are studying was their treated geojute. So this is used for facilities where flows conveyed via overland channel, which for our project was Swim Facility 7. Uh, so this jute functions as an erosion control blanket and is biodegradable within, within two to five years. Um, so it makes this erosion control, uh, this jute superior to just traditional jutes is the Lynx Ultrabind technology, which is infused into the woven material which helps bind the geodute to the underlying soil, allowing it to function more effectively for erosion control. And then it can be used in conjunction with other methods like the rock check dams or um, with clear flows gel flocculent blocks um, for sediment control. So again, we have a quick video of the installation. So very simple, it's just laid out along the channel. And then you can pin it in place until it's bound to the soil underneath, at which point the pins are no longer necessary. Right, so these blocks do need to be maintained regularly. Um, the rate at which this happens uh, is dependent on the volume and velocity of water and so, uh, sediment that's flowing over them. Uh, so on average, this maintenance cycle is approximately every three months, um, which for our use in uh, southern Ontario is three cycles per year. As due to the low flow and freezing over the winter months, uh, it doesn't need to be installed for that season. Um, so then to test or to monitor the performance of ClearFlow's ASTs, we implemented a sampling program over the course of a year from, from spring 2020 to spring 2021. Uh, so continuous flow monitoring stations were installed at each inlet and outlet. And during precipitation events, water quality samples were collected. So the parameters tested include uh, TSS, total phosphorus, chlorides, turbidity, and a TSS particle distribution analysis. So this uh, particle distribution analysis was to be able to determine the relative amounts of each size of sediment uh, coming in and flowing out of the swim facilities. So our first major parameter that we are looking at is TSS. So this is the average removal over the course of our sampling period. And I'll just explain this chart to you. So the first column there is the, our removal efficiency, uh, the average removal efficiency based on our particle distribution results. So this takes into account particles less than two micrometers to greater than 40 micrometers. And then in our second column, we have our removal efficiency based off our uh, TSS samples sent to BV laboratories, which can only take into account sediments that are greater than two micrometers in diameter, which is why there's a discrepancy between those two columns. Our third column there is a calculation done by Greenland on the as-designed efficiency on how the ponds would have performed if clear flow products were not installed. 
And the final column there is a theoretical calculation on how the ponds would have performed uh, if they performed to the MECP guidelines. So that assumes that no particles less than 20 micrometers in diameter are being settled in our ponds. So we're mainly focusing on our first and third columns. So we saw a very clear improvement on our unstabilized sites. So we saw an average removal efficiency of 90% uh, at our unstabilized sites compared to average removal rates of 60% pre-installation or 78% based on our as-designed efficiency. So just an example during one event at SWIM4 here, uh, so 95 millimeters of rain fell over the course of a day. Um, and if you're looking at, looking at our chart there, the first column is all the sediment coming in at the inlet, and the second column is sediment leaving at the outlet. Um, and all the blue and orange uh, bars there are all the sediment that's less than 20 micrometers in diameter. So the vast majority of sediment that's coming in is very fine and would traditionally not be being removed at this pond. You can see most uh, of the sediment is being settled. We saw an average remove, so we saw a removal efficiency of 74% during this event compared to an as designed efficiency of 36% if these clear flow products hadn't had not been installed. So then our second major parameter that we are looking at was phosphorus. So again, we saw very high phosphorus removal um, efficiency over the course of our sampling period. Um, and that phosphorus removal follows the trend of TSS reduction. Um, so as the TSS, as you're removing more TSS, you're also being able to improve the phosphorus removal. So though, although we didn't test it as part of this study, you would expect similar results for any, any other nutrients or metals that sorb to sediments. Um, so then in, in addition to improving water quality, these ASTs also provide significant cost savings um, compared to conventional site stabilization and phosphorus offsetting costs. So we saw a minimum benefit cost ratio of at least 1.44 um, compared to conventional uh, site stabilization methods. Um, so this focus slide focuses a bit more on the municipal uh, liability, although it's very applicable for corporations as well. Um, so we can, once we have shown that these uh, ASTs are efficient at improving water quality, we can then look at how they can potentially reduce uh, liability and benefit municipalities and corporations um, as the approach to stormwater management and wastewater uh, management shifts. Uh, so insurance rates are rising and through the use of data driven projects um, that can prove that ASTs are effective at reducing risk, there is the potential um, for reduced premiums or lower claims or fines from insurance companies. Um, and there, we may be seeing more of a shift towards outcome based approaches um, for stormwater management in the future. Um, so looking at discharge water quality objectives where conventional methods um, are, not, uh, are not effective um, to be able to meet these objectives. So just some conclusions about this, on this project before I pass it off to Brad. So ClearFlow's ASTs provide a clear benefit to TSS removal on unstabilized sites are proven to be very effective at removing sediment less than 40 micrometers in diameter. Uh, we also observed similar results for phosphorus removal. Uh, so these ASTs can then assist municipalities and corporations and developers uh, in achieving long-term goals surrounding sediment management and site stabilization. Uh, in addition, imp implementation is found to be very straightforward and efficient. Um, so then insights that were gained from this land development application uh, were then helpful to optimize ClearFlow's product formula uh, to apply these ASTs in the mining resource industry. So with that, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and then pass this right off to Brad. Thank you, Kristen. I'll uh, get my screen up. And uh, thank you, Charles, uh, for having us today. And uh, good day to everybody uh, in the audience. <clears throat> Welcome. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Kristen. Uh, we're uh, excited to be uh, talking to the mining uh, folks today. Uh, our company has been in the, uh, in, the, in the business with miners for, for over a decade with some really long-term clients, uh, which I will describe to you. I'll give you a brief, uh, brief history of ClearFlow, um, and then uh, perhaps uh, 
at the end of the presentation, if we have time, we'll have a, a demonstration of the product uh, live for you. Uh, the company started in 2005. Um, it's uh, evolved since then. Uh, in 2016, we, uh, we uh, shed the consulting part of our business and went uh, more to a manufacturing. Uh, in 2020, we opened a new U.S. Uh, branch, uh, Clearfield Group U.S., uh, which is in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we manufacture proprietary products for water treatment, sediment, and erosion control. Um, our owner, Jerry Hanna, is a uh, member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. So if uh, Indigenous status is something you're, uh, you're looking to include in your, in your projects, uh, we will be able to provide that as well. Um, mining clients, uh, we have some, some major miners, some junior miners, and some, some placer miners out there. Uh, Newmont, Barrick, Victoria Gold, uh, Westmoreland, uh, Tech Resources, Rio Tinto, Tasco Mines, uh, I Am Gold. Uh, we have a reseller in Brazil, uh, Alpha Water, uh, which handles our mining business there. A uh, reseller in the UK, Frog Environmental, uh, which handles our construction. And a reseller in Quebec uh, through Mavericks. Uh, specifically, the gel flocculants, uh, which, which Kristen uh, so aptly uh, uh, described for you guys, um, is our proprietary product. Uh, we manufacture them here in, in, in Alberta and in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, some of the pros and cons to the product, um, they're environmentally friendly. Uh, we've done a lot of research um, before we even started selling the product onto their, their fish friendliness. Um, we worked with the University of Alberta, uh, the uh, Canadian Research Council, um, and uh, University of Guelph uh, to develop the product. Um, so it's been in use for over 15 years now. Uh, we're very comfortable with its safety factor um, and, and its uh, overall environmental impact uh, in all of our projects. Uh, the great thing about it is low capex and low opex. Uh, it doesn't take uh, an, an outside power source to work. Um, all it takes is a gravity flow of water. Um, so there's not a lot of inputs as far as uh, you know, the capex or the opex uh, side of the business. It's got a low carbon footprint because we don't require uh, outside power. Uh, we don't need a de diesel generator. Uh, we don't need solar equipment. We don't need anything. Uh, to make the product work. Uh, it's easy to use. Uh, it comes in a ready state form. You see the blocks there uh, in the slide. Um, though that's how they come out of the box. You simply hook them uh, up to your uh, device that you want to, to, to have them uh, hold in the water and away you go. Uh, they're passive, uh, they're self-limiting. Um, the self-limiting part is very important. Um, there are products out in the industry that uh, would, would dissolve instantly uh, when you put them in water. Uh, those products uh, can be dangerous to, to fish and aquatic habitat. Um, our products are very slow releasing, and I'll show you that in our video. They're designed to protect aquatic habitat. They're designed to be used in fish bearing streams. Um, a lot of our mining companies um, are on the eastern slopes of the uh, Rocky Mountains uh, with a very sensitive uh, bull trout uh, habitat. And uh, we've been working with the Alberta Energy Regulator for over a decade uh, to protect those fish species. Uh, the product itself has a high pH tolerance as well, and it has a long shelf life. The product, uh, if kept in its original packaging, uh, would last well over five years in storage. The first step, um, if, you're, if you're thinking about trying out the product, is sampling. Uh, what we're doing is chemistry. Uh, and in order to define uh, which products are going to work best, and we have several products, uh, gel flocculants that we, we, can, we can pull from. Uh, we need a sample from you, whether that's water or soil. Um, you send it to us uh, and we, we select the appropriate flocculant uh, that's free of charge. Uh, if you're looking for more than TSS removal, if you want to know about phosphorus or metals, uh, we send those samples out to a third party laboratory. Uh, that way we have a clear independent uh, source of information uh, for our customers uh, to determine the product's effectiveness. You'll see here, this is a, a typical sample report, uh, the different types of water links blocks here. Uh, sometimes we use them in a duplex um, combination, so a 494 and a 360 or a 398. Uh, that helps us uh, to, to achieve the, uh, the maximum uh, TSS removal. Um, here's, a, here's a slide, an interesting one about metals reduction. Uh, this is from a uh, coal mining uh, operation, again, on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, here we took a uh, coal pile and we also took the tailings and we treated them with our product and then sent them off to a third party laboratory. You see the metals removal is quite good. Uh, this top bar uh, is 100%, so the, 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 the tall blue is 100%. And then you're looking at the amount of reduction here 
uh, with the teal. And then there's another smaller blue one. Uh, you can see it here on the tit uh, titanium. Uh, that would be uh, an untreat or a, uh, a tailings. And the tall one would be, uh, the, the medium sized one would be coal treated. So again, uh, lots of metals being removed very easily. Um, all we need is the blocks in situ uh, or in a pump through device and then some sort of settling pond um, to get those materials to come out. Uh, here is a specific one for a gold miner uh, in Nevada and a gold miner in South America. Here we're looking specifically at arsenic. And arsenic is an important one because arsenic and phosphorus are uh, one on top of each other on the periodic table of elephants. And that helps us uh, know that when we can get phosphorus out or arsenic out, uh, the other one is probably coming out too. Um, so uh, if you're looking to remove arsenic, uh, we have a viable solution for that. Uh, again, the gel flocculants uh, come in two forms, basically a block, which we put in open streams or channels. And then we have slabs. So we have slabs that we put in our uh, patented devices that allow uh, you to pump water through the device and then have dosing occur. And then it's, uh, as it leaves the device, mixing happens and it's pumped to your pond. And when it gets to your pond, it's ready to sell out. Uh, we have basically four types of blocks. We have a 400 series, which is a mixed flocculant. We have a 300 series, which is a generally anionic flocculant. We have the 600 series, uh, which is a cationic flocculant. And then we have the cationic neutralizer to go with the 600 series. What we know about fish uh, and fish gills is that they do not like cationic polymers. Uh, cationic polymers bind to fish gill tissue, uh, causing hypoxia. Uh, and the fish die, which is not what we want to happen. Um, so we always try to uh, prescribe anionic flocculants wherever possible, but there are some instances where cationics are the ones that work best. And if we use those in that instance, we put a neutralizing uh, block downstream to make sure we don't have any residual uh, cationic uh, flocculant in the water. Uh, blocks, uh, this is how they work. Uh, they need to be in flow flowing water, if you put them in stagnant water, not a lot's going to happen. We need a velocity of uh, between 0.3 and 1.5 meters per second. This allows the sediment laden water to strip the um, flocculant from the block and uh, have it mix well as well. Uh, the reaction time is normally between one and two minutes. So what we do is we position the blocks one or two minutes of flow time upstream of your pond. That way, by the time uh, everything gets to the pond, uh, it should be mixed well the blocks should be large enough to start to settle up. Okay, typically we put the 400 series block in front of the 300 series block. Okay, and then uh, the 600 and 300 series are almost always downstream of the 400, but we do sometimes put them upstream of the 400 if we're getting uh, some uh, uh, material sticking to the 400 block. Uh, dosing, uh, this is a very important. Um, the dosing is done, um, by the flowing water. Uh, so there's no real way to control the dosing. So that's why it's passive. It takes flowing water and sediment uh, to get the flocculant to come out of the block. And again, the block has been designed to, to release very slowly. So what we do is a general rule of thumb is we have one block for every 50 gallons per minute of flow, okay? If you're using a duplex, so you need two types of blocks, you'll need two blocks for every 50 gallons per minute of flow. Uh, this number can increase or decrease uh, depending on lab testing and reaction time in the field. Flow and mixing, again, very important to place the blocks in turbulent flow to release the product. Again, stagnant water, the blocks will only swell. Uh, mixing brings the smaller particles together to make them heavy enough to settle. That's the block creation, and that's what we wanna see happening. Uh, again, we're not magically disappearing uh, the TSS out of the water. We're just getting it to settle. So we do need some sort of pond or filtration device downstream of the, uh, the blocks in order to get the whole process to work. Now, if you have ultra, ultra fine materials in your water, uh, we do have a polishing curtain as well. Uh, we use a, a treated jute for that. Um, and then we, we build that, uh, a float uh, system for that curtain to hang in the water, uh, which allows us uh, to catch little tiny, tiny minute, uh, less than two micron sized particles uh, that might typically be carried in water if it's flowing. This is typically what block placement can look like. Uh, you see it there in a culvert on a rope. Uh, you see it on a chain in a constructed ditch. And then you see it in the irrigation canal in, uh, in Arizona there on the very right. Uh, so the blocks have a lot uh, uh, of ways to be installed, uh, as simple or as complicated as you'd like to make it. 
Uh, the most important part again is flowing water and turbulent water. Now, if you're if you have water that you're pumping and you want to be able to treat it uh, on the on the fly, uh, we have devices which we we put our gel flocculants inside of. Uh, they're rated uh, PR100 to up to a PR1000. Those numbers on the back end are the maximum flow rates. So a PR100 uh, flows 30 to 100 gallons per minute. A PR300 flows uh, typically 100 to 300 gallons per minute and a PR1000, uh, 400 to 1000 gallons per minute. You can set these up in parallel. Uh, so if you have flow rates that are, let's say 3000 gallons per minute, uh, we, we set up three of our PR1000s in parallel and uh, manifold them and you just pump water directly to them and then have them come out and manifold back into a main pipe and then off to your, uh, your settling basin. Okay. Uh, also to note the PR1000, if you need to adjust pH or add any other type of chemical, we have a dosing port, port on there. So if you do need to do something like a pH adjustment, uh, we can do that on the fly as well. So this is what the PR100 uh, looks like. Uh, here we have one installed at an, an Agnico mine uh, that's just being built uh, in uh, the Yukon, I believe. Uh, here it's on a truck wash. So what they're doing is recycling their truck wash water uh, through a PR100, uh, having it settle and then reusing that water. So a great way uh, to stop pulling fresh water from the environment and use the water you already have to reduce your uh, your carbon footprint and improve your environmental sustainability. Again, you see the uh, the cartridges there on the left, uh, they're mesh. Uh, that helps us get the flocculant out of the block. So water flows in tangentially into the unit, flows up and then flows down through the center and out, uh, allowing the block to dose on the outside and the inside. This is our PR300, a very simple device. It's basically a pipe uh, with a chain on the inside, which we put the blocks on. And then you put the, uh, the device in your, in your flow path. So if you've got a small trash pump uh, that's running uh, a three inch or smaller uh, that you can uh, get the flow down to 300 gallons per minute on, uh, you could use this device uh, to treat water uh, as well. Uh, here's the PR1000. Um, this has been very popular with our mining customers uh, at higher flow rates. Um, it's a great way to remove sediment from water inexpensively. Uh, we could also remove metals again and phosphorus. What we do here is we have six different cartridges that we put inside this main body. The main body is about eight feet long. This vortex piece on the front is about three to four. So really we've got a 12 foot unit um, that's uh, highly mobile and portable, made all of stainless steel, has lifting davits, forks on it. Uh, it's meant to be carried uh, around on your site and used where needed. Uh, here's one in action. This is uh, at a uh, mining site in, again, the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains near our office. Uh, you'll see there that the pond actually has water on it, frozen water, sorry, uh, ice. Uh, so they're pumping very cold water through this unit. It's going into the unit at about 3,400 NTUs, and the pond is about 25 NTUs um, once the water hits it. So uh, again, that's a, like a 99.99% reduction in TSS, all through one device. Here's the, uh, the treated jute that, uh, that Kristen had mentioned in her presentation. You'll see there that it's lining the bottom of a, of a, of a, of a constructed ditch that's lined with a, a, a plastic. Then it has rocks to create a rock check. We line it. And then we also made some curtains in this, uh, in this particular ditch as well. Um, so that's a, a great way to remove or capture material uh, as it moves through your ditch. If you want to capture material in the ditch to remove it, uh, we have the, uh, the uh, silt mat as well. The silt mat is four by six. Um, it, it can hold up to about 40 kilograms of sediment. So if, you're, if you have a, a culvert uh, that likes to wash out, uh, this is a great place to put uh, the silt mat is at the end of a culvert. But if you want to collect sediment material as water flows through that ditch, um, these, these mats are, are excellent at doing that. They have uh, lifting tabs on the bottom of them. So all you do is fold them over, uh, hook up your, your excavator, uh, pull it out, uh, lay it on the ground, sprinkle grass on it, and it will grow grass uh, very effectively. So it works as a, as a remediation product as well once you've collected the silt in it. You can also place them, again, directly under the water. Uh, here they've used rocks. Uh, again, very simple. You don't need a bunch of uh, stuff that you can't find or need to order in to get these things to work. Uh, they've all been designed to work simply 
and to be made for mining companies to use in areas where there is no power, uh, it's hard to reach, uh, it takes you know, a, an, alt, uh, uh, an ATV to get to the site. Um, so we have, we have a, a very simple product that can be used uh, almost anywhere on your mine site. Uh, I'm going to move to the, the, the live demonstration and then we'll do questions after that. How am I doing on time, Charles? Uh, we are a little bit over time by about one minute, but how long is your video? Uh, it'll be really short. It's live, so I'll do go it really it. quickly. Um, so uh, I'll get right to yeah. it. If, if, yeah, go, if, go for it. If, if, if anybody needs to drop off, you know what? We are recording the session as well. Uh, so please um, make sure to watch that video if you do drop off a little bit earlier. But please go ahead, uh, Brad. Thanks, Charles. Uh, so what I've got here is some uh, typical construction material. This was uh, off of a roadway construction near our office, the Anthony Hende. I'm just going to uh, put a little bit of that into this uh, cup. Okay. 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 Oh, 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 Brad, we're only seeing questions and say and, and thank you. Uh, oh, you might want to share a I'm different so screen. Sorry. Yeah. No problem, mate. Let me uh, let me stop sharing. Okay. There we go. How's that, everybody? Okay. Now is it? Oh, you're actually doing a live demo. Yeah, okay. I'm doing a live demo. Um, so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spotlight you. There you go. <laughs> uh, here's that construction material I was talking about. I uh, put it in this cup. I'm just going to add some water here. So I've just simulated a rain event. Uh, we've got water flowing down the ditch. It's getting dirty. Uh, what I've got are two small pieces of our 494 and 360 block. I'm going to put them in here. Add a little bit of water just so you guys can see that they don't dissolve. This is the important part. The product doesn't dissolve. It takes flowing water across it in order for it to, to come out. Um, so if I stir it up here a little bit, just get it kind of, you'll see there the, the blocks are there. Uh, they're not doing too much. Again, we need sediment laden water. We need particulate in order for the block to work. Uh, here we've got the, our dirty water. And what I'm going to do is uh, pour these back and forth to simulate water flowing across the block in a ditch situation. Okay. You see there that the water is, is quite dirty. Uh, this can take anywhere from uh, 10 seconds to two minutes. Um, so hopefully it'll be a, a quick reaction here this morning because uh, I know we're a little bit uh, over on time. Uh, it's starting to work now, I can see. So I'll just give it a couple more spins here. One more. Give it a little shake there. And you'll see there that uh, our water is uh, getting cleaner. Wow. Yeah. So if I let this sit for, uh, for a, a minute or two here, we'll have uh, almost crystal clear water as those pin flocks start to fall. You'll see there the sediment on the bottom. And I'm not sure if you can see this, but there's the chunks of block still uh, in the water. If I were to uh, you know, pour this back and forth again, we would have the same thing happening. So again, reentrainment uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, we get the same result uh, as uh, as water is allowed uh, to settle. All right, that's it. Questions for Kristen and I. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for showing us that uh, demo. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I do have a question from uh, one of our participants. I'm going to open up their line to ask the question, and then we'll just take the one question, folks, and then we will definitely entertain other questions via email. I'm going to ask Bernie to unmute himself so he can ask his question. Bernie, please go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks, Charles. Uh, and thanks, everyone, Kristen and Brad. Uh, very interesting and, and intriguing. Uh, I come from the mining sector, so I'm, I'm coming from that perspective. Uh, spent a lot of time in tailings management areas and uh, treatment systems there. Uh, that's why that explains my gray hair. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, so uh, it looks very effective in reducing sediment. Um, now there's a flow rate, there's certain flow rate dependencies on the, uh, on the effectiveness of the material. Uh, and uh, forgive me, I, I haven't got fully digested the entire presentation yet, but I'm just, uh, in terms of dissolved metals uh, is a particular aspect that I'm, I'm, I'm keen on. Um, uh, dependency on uh, how sensitive is the flow rate, how sensitive is it to pH, and, and sensitive to temperature dependency on those, sure. Per, for example. Sure, sure. Uh, so temperature, I'll start with that one because it's important. Um, waters below 5 degrees Celsius would require twice as many blocks as we would normally prescribe. Uh, because the cold water inhibits the release of the material from the product. Um, 
if we get over 25 degrees Celsius, then we need less blocks and they will last not as long because the product will be uh, coming out of the block more quickly. Um, so typically a block, uh, which is uh, this size, will treat 20,000 cubic meters of water. Uh, a treatment cost of about six cents per cubic meter uh, for those of you who are interested in the price. Um, your other question was about um, dissolved metals. So dissolved metals was something we didn't think that we'd be able to do, but the more testing that we do, the more and more we're finding, uh, depending on, of course, on the constituents in the water, if your water is high in alkalinity, uh, you know, other factors, uh, different, uh, different constituents can affect uh, how things are pulled out. So that's why we want to do testing for every single site so that we can actually tell you if it's going to work or not. We just don't have enough data. We've got probably about 50 or 60 mining clients, which we've run the data through, uh, but that's not a data set that I'm comfortable with. I'd like to see that well up over 100 uh, before we started making, uh, you know, uh, real, um, you know, uh, statements about how great it is. What we want to do is test it. Um, you know, that's fairly inexpensive to do. It gives you a real result um, and, uh, and something you can work with. Did that answer all your questions, Bernie? That, that was that was helpful. And yeah, and and I again, it's a learning exercise uh, for this product. I mean, it, you demonstrated uh, in, in your presentation uh, some effectiveness areas, which is intriguing for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other question I'll leave and then I'll leave it to the floor is uh, in once the flocculant has bound and been settled into a yeah. settlement area, how stable is it over time? Um, so over time, the flocculant is going to break down. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it breaks down in the environment, um, so it is biodegradable. Um, what happens to the material that's bound to it? It ends up in the bottom of the pond. So just like any other tailings, you're going to end up with that material. Now, we do have a product that we uh, call UltraBind. Uh, we worked in China um, about five years ago on, uh, on a, uh, I believe it was an electronics processing uh, facilities pond, a massive one. And what we did was we took another product called UltraBind, we added it to the slurry that was left over, and then we added another product to it, and we bound it and made it into a hard mass, uh, a brick, if you will. Uh, so that's one way that the polymer uh, flocculants can work uh, in conjunction um, to help stabilize what's in your tailings pond um, so that it doesn't leach out. Uh, we had, a, we had a, uh, uh, an agreement with the... Uh, uh, NRC, uh, they provided some funding, but we were unable to secure a sample from a mining client of their tailings. As you can imagine, mining clients don't don't want many people to know what's in their tailings. It's a it's a, it's an issue for them. So getting samples from them was difficult. But we would love to be able to find a mining client who's willing to work with us uh, to on their tailings to 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 get some real results. Well, if you need samples, give me a shout. I'll, <laughs> Perfect. I'll, I'll, Thank you. No <laughs> worries. Appreciate that. Yeah, okay. Brett, 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 thank you, uh, thank thank you, you very you. much. And that was a real uh, actual request if you need it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, Benny. Benny, I will definitely connect you to, to Brad. Uh, Brad, maybe, um, Kirsten, maybe there's one more question here and then we'll, we'll end our call. We are over already. But the question here is from Jean Philippe. And the question is based on the different testing and applications, do you have data that can help to design settling devices? So are, are we talking about clarifiers? If we're talking about clarifiers, we're actually in, in, in the production of our own clarifier mm -hmm. using our own gel flocculants. So really okay. a device that will be both the, the flocculation and settling pieces together. Um, you know, depending on flow rates, that device could look rather large. Um, typically, there are clarifiers out there in the world. Uh, typically, mining customers use uh, liquid flocculants in those big clarifiers uh, to do what they do. Um, so, uh, yes, we, 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 can, we can use our flocculants upstream of um, clarifiers or filters. Absolutely. Uh, we have one in design, um, and we can help you uh, determine how much flocculant you might need. Uh, if you're going that direction, for sure. Okay, Brad, it's what more I did, on, the, uh, on the settling velocities, uh, for example. Uh, Jim Philip, go ahead. Go ahead again. Yes, it's uh, more about uh, the settling velocities. Uh, okay. So I don't know if you have some some data according to the different applications that um, settling velocities that we can apply. Uh, to, to design yeah, or to figure out the what the, the surface uh, area that uh, we we need to uh... sure 
I, th I think, well, I think that's, those sorts of numbers need to come from testing uh, because, because every, every you know, water type is going to have different constituents. It's going to have a different amount of mass. The particle sizes, as you saw in Kristen's um, uh, slide, where we had the 40 micron, the 20, the less than 20, and then the less than two, um, there's a lot of material in there that, that is, is not going to readily settle. Uh, and that can change uh, from you know, uh, having one site on your, on your mine uh, open uh, or your stripping overburden off you know, that'll change the profile mm -hmm. completely. Um, so I think that that's something that's really case by case, uh, Jean-Philippe. Um, so yes, I, think, I know, but yeah. uh, perhaps you have uh, some some data just uh, more specifically for, for mining uh, or okay. more for specifically for uh, sewage overflows or... Um... Yeah, so, so, so typically there, there are calculations out there for designing a stormwater facility or a settling pond. Uh, we would work with inside of those parameters. Um, but if we can settle the material much more quickly, we can often reduce the size of those ponds. Mm -hmm. uh, we also like to put a four bay in the pond. This way we capture those readily settable materials right in one section where it can be easily cleaned out as opposed to having to clean out you know, five acres of pond. We're now cleaning out, let's say, an acre of pond. Uh, which is uh, which yes, can be a, a mm -hmm. large cost savings to to the uh, to the mine for sure. All right, thank you for answering that question, and thank you, Jean Philippe, for asking the question. Okay, folks, uh, we are past our time, but we did have a great uh, question and answer period then. And uh, let's just again thank um, Brad and Kirsten for the presentation, and also thank our guests from across the country for coming on the call. Uh, you will definitely, uh, Brad, you didn't just drink the water with a sediment in it, did you? No, okay, no, but oh. if you want to see the two side by side, there they are. So, All right, this sorry. Is, this is the water I drink, and that's the water I drink. So. Oh, there you go. You, you caught me off guard there for a second. <laughs> All right, so again, everybody, thank you for coming on the call. We will send you a video link so that you can rewatch this um, presentation. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Kirsten. Okay.